Welcome to DC Schmooze with OU Advocacy. We're getting to know some of our nation's elected leaders and learning about their policy goals. Join us as we dive in. Hello, I'm Nathan Diamond, Executive Director of the OU Advocacy Center, and this is a special edition of the DC Schmooze. The DC Schmooze is usually on Capitol Hill talking to legislators, but there was a very significant case heard across the street from the US Capitol yesterday at the United States Supreme Court uh, in a case that's very important to the Orthodox Jewish community, as well as other faith communities across the United States. I'm pleased to be joined uh, on this edition by Professor Michael Avi Helfand, uh, with whom, full disclosure, is my partner in crime, uh, not a crime, but we, we co-authored a brief uh, to the Supreme Court in this case. Uh, and we're going to talk about it a little bit. I'll let you all in on what happened in the arguments yesterday uh, and where we think this very important case is headed. So. Uh, Avi, why don't you uh, lead it off by giving a quick summary of what the case Groff versus DeJoy is about. Uh, so first of all, uh, nice to be here with you, Nathan, and uh, glad to be partnering, uh, although not yet in crime. So that's uh, we've we've got something to aspire to. Um, so Groff v. DeJoy's a case about religious accommodation in the workplace. How far does an employer have to go um, in order to um, uh, accommodate a religious employee? Um, the case uh, uh, starts off with a uh, somebody who's working for the U.S. Postal Service, um, Groff. Uh, and Mr. Groff uh, is a Sabbatarian, although his Sabbath is on Sunday. He's an evangelical Christian, and he informs the post office that he cannot work on Sunday. Um, he actually bounces around a little bit trying to find a particular place where maybe the fact that he um, cannot work on Sunday isn't a problem, but um, really generated by the fact that the U.S. Postal Service, uh, in an attempt to make some more money, um, enters into an agreement with uh, Amazon, uh, Mr. Groff ends up in a position where he is needed to work on Sunday, and his faith uh, prohibits him from doing so. And the ultimate question of the case is, how far does the U.S. Postal Service have to go under Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act? How far does the U.S. Postal Service have to go in order to accommodate uh, Mr. Groff's um, religious commitments? Right. And, um, and, and that's a question because back in 1977, well, we should go back five years before that. In 1972, the uh, Congress amended the Civil Rights Act to say that employers were encouraged or urged or prodded, they didn't use any of those words, to accommodate an employee's religious needs. Unless doing that would impose, and this is the language of the law, an undue hardship on the employer. Um, which sounds like, right, it has to be hard for the employer to do it. But then in 1977, in a case involving now defunct TWA Airlines, uh, the court said, actually, undue hardship means not very much. Uh, the fancy Latin words they used were de minimis. Um, and so pretty much any inconvenience to the employer gets them off the hook. Um, and this case is about reexamining that standard. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah, that's right. And you know, as you say, Nathan, it, it's always been a puzzle, TWA v. Hardison, since the day was decided. You have this this language in the statute that was, um, it, the legislative history is clear. Um, it was intended um, to protect, in particular, um, people who were Sabbatarians. There, the, uh, it was Seventh-day Adventist, uh, had in mind um, to protect people whose Sabbath was on Saturday. And the language of undue hardship made it sound like, you know, the employer's got to work a little bit in order to provide a Foundation. Supreme Court, however, at least uh, in TWA v. Hardison, said, no, that you just have to, anything that's a de minimis burden. Sounds like uh, the Supreme Court was using yesterday the argument where it's like trifling, uh, um, even uh, inconvenience, anything that uh, just makes the employer stretch a little bit is considered an undue hardship, which at least until uh, until this case, until, until Graf v. DeJoy, sounded like... Um, there wasn't much pressure, at least as a matter of federal law, mm. on employers um, to require, uh, to actually accommodate. Um, the right. Rules. And so obviously for our community, uh, that's that's significant. Just think about earlier this month, right? Uh, if you were in the United States, you had four days of Yom Tov on four weekdays within a two-week period. And if you had to work generally specific days, you needed, you needed to get time up. And this isn't only about scheduling issues. It can be about wearing a yarmulke to the workplace for Muslim women. It could be about wearing a headscarf. 
uh, for six wearing turbans um, and other issues as well. Um, so I, I, I got to go to the court yesterday to hear the arguments. Um, and uh, one thing I'll say is it was it was a really long session. You, uh, it used to be that uh, oral arguments in the Supreme Court were half hour, um, you know, with both between both sides or a little bit more. This went almost two hours. Um, and uh, the justices were were very engaged. Um, I from 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 my perspective, sitting there and listening, uh, first of all, I'll say both the lawyers, I think, did very well uh, in terms of their performance. Um, I actually walked out with three uh, with three uh, key points. One, uh, no one was defending the notion that uh, the minimal standard, the de minimis standard, is the right standard. Uh, even the government's attorney, the solicitor general, who's defending the Postal Service because the Postal Service is part of the government. Although, by the way, there were a lot of snarky comments made about the Postal Service um, and its lack of profitability. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, uh, the solicitor general uh, was not saying, yes, we should keep the standard as low as possible and not let, not have employers have a tougher requirement. She was asserting that it's really not so bad out there uh, that uh, if you look at reported cases, religious employees are winning accommodations. And if you look at how the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, handles these things and also issues guidance, they lean forward into this and employers are, are pushed a little bit more. And so basically, her argue, she wasn't defending the, 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 this week standard. She said, it's really not so bad out in the real world. I'll come back to that in a second. And even the justices who were expressing reservations in their questioning about um, uh, ab about overturning Hardison were really not, again, they weren't saying, yes, we should only have religious people accommodated, you know, if it's not too much trouble. It was more about bigger questions of, is it really appropriate for the court to overrule a 40-plus-year-old precedent? Shouldn't Congress really fix this rather than us? Um, so one thing, again, I walked out at number one was no one's defending this low standard. Number two, um, um, that, uh, there wasn't, in a certain sense, there wasn't a lot of daylight even between the two sides. So we, and Justice Gorsuch pushed on this the most, um, trying to find that he was, uh, he was engaging in a search for common ground. He said, well, you say you, Groff's lawyer says, the standard should be significant difficulty or expense. And you, the Solicitor General, you're using a term from a footnote uh, in the Hardison opinion that says substantial cost. And he kind of was like, isn't that really the same thing? Can't we all just agree here? Um, at one point, Justice Kagan said, oh, we're all having this kumbaya moment. Isn't this so, yeah. Um, but, um, um, so, 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 but I want, you know, there are differences, especially if they explicitly overturn Hardison or not, if they assert a new standard or not. But on the other hand, again, they were looking for something that was stronger. Um, and so, um, and the third thing that I, that you clearly heard in the arguments yesterday was how fact-specific, how context-specific these cases are, right? And the justices recognize that. It's a different one, it's gonna be one scenario if you're talking about somebody Forget about the mailman who's working for the postal service that's contract service that's contracted with. If you're an employee at Amazon, right, it's easier for an, a company the size of Amazon with the resources of Amazon to accommodate people than for some small business that only has 20 employees and so on and so forth. Um, and so the justices were also grappling with that. Well, whether we rewrite a new rule and use new words or whatever it is, we're really... Um, we're really still going to be putting this back to the lower courts and back out into the world um, in a situation where it's still going to be case by case, fact based decisions. Um, that was really what I walked out with. Um, you listen to the arguments at a distance. I wonder what your reflections are. Yeah, and very consistent with yours. I would say, you know, what are we talking about over here? We're trying to use words. Um, or at least a, a standard to interpret words in a statute. It says employers have to accommodate somebody who's religious in the workplace unless it's an undue hardship. Words are very hard to put in practice. Um, so what does that mean? 
Um, so the court said you don't have to do anything that's more than originally 1977, more than a de minimis burden. You don't have to do much. Once it's even a little bit difficult, you're good. You just say to the employee, I don't have to do this. You know, the, you know, Groff is, is looking for a standard and I think the Orthodox Union as well in the brief, the amicus brief that we filed. I, I should also, of course, give a shout out to the Pepperdine Hugh and Hazel Darling Religious Liberty Clinic that um, took on the bulk of the work for it. It's exciting to have uh, my home institution, Pepperdine University and uh, uh, Pepperdine University and the Orthodox Union working together. Um, so, you know, what we're you know, all the, those uh, fighting on behalf of Groff, I mean, the, the point is to try to find words, a standard that are likely to nudge lower courts when they're actually dealing with this case to, to require more of the employer and find those words. Um, and, you know, but, but Groff's position was just get rid of the words de minimis and get rid of the decision, start again, and use words that we use in other areas of the law that undo hardship, that it's a um, significant expense. You have to go as far as um, put real resources in unless it becomes too significant an expense. Um, that was the goal of the suit. And, you know, even as you said, as you said, Nathan, you know, the government here is in, in trying to defend the Art, the TWAV artisan and the old standard, they don't, they don't really think the old de minimis even a little bit, you know, is that the employer's off the hook. They don't think those words are enough. And what they really wanted was, and we really emphasize this, to try to not get rid of precedent so that all these cases that we've had over time, you, know, you can still use them to get a sense of what's going on. So they don't really want the old words, but they want to keep the old words with the old cases and introduce maybe a couple more words, but not too many more words um, that will make employers do more, but not like make the law start again. And it, it was hard really to figure out, you know, the justices really, really press on this, like, where is the difference between the two of you? And what I came away with was the very, cl the clearest area of difference. And, and I think this matters. Um, for American American Jews, Orthodox Jews, in part, you know, Orthodox Jews in particular, um, was in instances where you had an ongoing accommodation. Um, uh, this was of premium wages. Now, now think about how do these cases go? Usually, you know, most of the time, you know, sometimes advocates will paint this as well. The religious employee is gonna is gonna leave work, and the those who are left are gonna have to shoulder the burden, but. The reality is, in most of these cases, the employer can solve the problem by offering somebody overtime or additional wages, and it's really about the cost to the employer. I mean, we're talking about U.S. Postal Service, which everybody mentioned is having a little bit of trouble, but Amazon, you know, is involved in the picture over here, and you know, you're talking about big companies with lots of money, and it sounds like a little bit of premium wages could solve a Sabbath problem. And here was, I think, the biggest difference between the two sides. The government said premium wages on an ongoing basis, that is too much to ask of an employer. And Groff said, no, uh, if you can afford it, the context still matters. But if Amazon has to pay an extra $5 an hour, a time and a half on an ongoing basis, you know, you're talking about something that's not significant, uh, not a significant impact on their bottom line. And they should, the law, undo hardship should require them to do that. And I think that's a, I think that's actually a big takeaway. Uh, when it comes to Sabbath observance, there was still some pretty significant daylight and daylight that matters, I would say, for people who are observing uh, a day of rest every week. Yeah. I, the, the, the other thought I had, and, you know, when you're when you're uh, at, when you're standing up, I've never done it, but I have to imagine when you're standing up at that podium in front of the nine justices, um, you you know, it's a very uh, nerve wracking situation. So I'm, I'm not saying the following to fault uh, uh, the attorney. The one argument I wish he had made, which he did not make, um, and I was thinking of as I was sitting there, was uh, in, in response to the the government's position of, oh, you know, that you have the EEOC and you have these court cases, is that so much of this um, is not about what ends up in court or even what ends up in the EEOC. The background rule, right, comes into play so much more because what happens is the employee walks into their manager and says, I need this, I need to leave early Friday afternoon for Shabbos. The manager calls up the deputy general counsel in the company's, uh, you know, what counsel's office and says, this employee just came in. What, what am I supposed to do? And the, the, the deputy counsel is going to say right now can say, well, you actually don't really need to do very much. 
um, you know, if you can do it without much fuss, fine. But if it's going to require you to spend whatever, five hours figuring it out, you're off, you know, we're off the hook. What, so if they change the rule, that's not going to be the answer that the deputy counsel is going to give. They say, no, you really need to try to figure this out. Uh, you need to try harder. And that's not necessary. And if the person gets told, no, that's not necessarily coming to court. That's not necessarily going to the EEOC. Um, and that's the importance from my point of view of, uh, of getting the, the standard changed as clearly as possible. Yeah, that sounds complete. I completely agree with that. You know, we're trying to, the, the goal of this lawsuit was to try to nudge the words that, um, government and courts use, um, just a little bit further to change the conversation, both practically and also as these cases are adjudicated. One of the interesting features was like the government kept on saying, Things aren't so bad if you look out in the world. There was one really interesting, well, a couple of interesting back and forth, but one of them was like, um, Just Alito said, well, what about all these amicus briefs we have from all these religious minorities, which, you know, some of them, you know- In fact, are... in fact I can tell you having been there, he actually held up the pile of briefs. That's interesting. That's <laughs> which cool. while, if, if you're watching this on uh, on videos and not just, I'm holding up our brief, it's the amicus briefs filed in the Supreme Court of this lovely- mint green color on the covers uh they, there's a whole color coding system for the briefs so he hold, held up a stack of mint green colored briefs when he when he said what you're what you're referring to yeah and um and he's and he said to the government like you're saying everything's fine out there we don't really need to change we don't need to get rid of the precedent we can just tinker with the words a little bit um and he said, all these folks are telling me this is terrible. There's some really good statistics in some of the amicus briefs, um, detailing of um, cases that have gone wrong where courts have said, oh, just de minimis. Um, so if like morale is a little bit low, you know, that's fine. Or, you know, people are a little annoyed. So you don't have to go that far. And the government said, no, these amicus briefs aren't giving you the, the full picture. But some of the statistics in those briefs are really startling. Like when you look, you know, one of the, the this has come up in previous cases as well. And when you look at who's making, uh, who's filing suit in these cases, who's filing suit before the, um, who's uh, filing suit before the EEOC, um, what you freak, the statistics show that religious minorities are uh, disproportionately represented in those lawsuits, and that's not surprising. You know, if in in the main, if your uh, if your Sabbath is on Sunday, most jobs are off on Sunday. But the reality is, if you're a religious minority and your calendar works a little different. Um, you're the one who's going to not fit in with society generally, and so you're going to be the one who's stuck. And in many ways, undue hardship as a stronger standard was meant to protect religious minorities whose calendars just work differently and are otherwise were being ha having a, a Christian calendar imposed on them. Right. The, uh, um, unfortunately, precedent on the books undermined that. And the goal of this case, and I think ultimately it will be successful in moving the ball, but really the question is, you know, how far, how many conversations in the workplace is it going to change? I think a lot, but we don't know how much and how many cases is it going to, is it going to change on the ground? Yeah, I, I, again, I walked out yesterday thinking, okay, our side, so to speak, is going to win this case, but I don't know, you know, with how many votes and how broad or how narrow, um, you know, that sounds to me like what you're saying as well. I'm also wondering, you know, we're sitting here, the arguments were yesterday, April 18th, the court wraps up its business one or about June 30th. Um, so they're under a lot of time pressure here, actually. Um, and I don't know, I'd welcome your thoughts uh, as we as we wrap up this conversation as to, you know, do you think the time pressure, uh, you know, pushes us in the, you know, towards towards uh, one, one, one direction or another, narrower or broader, um, or, or any other thoughts that you have about what we might expect from the court before the end of June? Um, again, it sounds like you're sharing intuition on this. My guess is we get an opinion that doesn't overturn TWA v. Hardison, but it does introduce language that um, makes courts, lower courts take notice that they need to be um, more serious in their expectations of employers in terms of providing accommodations to um, religious employees. And, you know, it's probably worth, you know, Nathan, you've done a ton of work over the decades on this issue just in terms of advocacy. Uh, in front of Congress, et cetera. Which I now regret because that all that legislative work did not result in an, the enactment of legislation. And one of the things that were going on in the court was they said, oh, you see, Congress didn't fix it. And that shows us, was one of the arguments, that Congress didn't want to fix it. 
had I known it would be used against us in court, I never would have wasted all that time. Well, I certainly don't think of the advocacy that way. It was, uh, it was the good and righteous fight um, to make sure that, you know, Jewish calendars also have uh, a say in terms of how American law works. You know, uh, Nathan, I think I've, we've chatted about this before. You know, when you go back to the history of um, Orthodox Jewish advocacy to its, like, beginnings in the early 1960s, I mean, you know, there were two big issues um, when when really Orthodox institutions started breaking away and really trying to build, you know, create their own voice through their own institutions. And the two big issues were equal funding, uh, making sure that religious institutions were treated like their uh, secular counterparts. If they were eligible for funding, they weren't dinged just because they were religious. And the other words was um, protection, uh, protections of Shabbos, uh, ways in which that American law, Title VII, other forms of religious accommodation would recognize the fact that that Jews had needed to take uh, couldn't work uh, on on a day of the week that was unconventional. And you know, it's in many ways religious. You read like sociologists in the nineteen sixties. And they all, you know, there was this expectation that orthodoxy would not survive. And the reason it wouldn't survive is one of the biggest reasons was, is how, how are orthodox Jews going to make a living? Um, if there's all this discrimination in the workplace, there are all these studies in the 50s, 20% of job descriptions expressly excluded uh, Jews. And the calendar just didn't work with, uh, you know, halakhic commitments. And the reality is the the fight for Sabbatarians, the fight for Shabbos, in many ways, is coming to fruition now. I think we're going to see some some um, important movement. Um, probably not uh, overturning, as you know, as sounds like we both agree of the old rules. But you know, this is a big deal. We've already seen. You know, we've done some of these conversations about the other cases that have allowed religious institutions to get funding on equal footing, and now we're seeing the what likely will be um, increased protections of um, Orthodox Jews' ability to practice, uh, to to keep Shabbos in the workplace. Um, in some ways, I, I feel like kind of, I was around the 1960s, but there's um, there's something that's um, really uh, optimistic, um, makes me feel like the, the battle that some people started in the 1960s and they worked hard and they sowed seeds and were finally over the last couple, uh, couple of years um, seeing ways in which the exclusion of Orthodox Jews from government, from funding, from the workplace, those things are increasingly falling away, which is super heartening to me. And that's a great note to end on. Always good to end, note on, it. I'll end on a note of optimism. Um, and uh, we'll be watching for when the court uh, issues its opinion, uh, probably at the end of June. And uh, thank you so much, Avi, for your partnership on the brief and your partnership in our advocacy at the OU Advocacy Center in general. Um, and for joining us for this conversation on this special edition of the DC Schmooze. Um, really my pleasure, pleasure, Nathan. Looking forward to doing more good work together. Thank you so much. All right, take care.